Good evening or good day to all of you. I am Yair Tauman. We met already briefly as an introduction that we, we uh, had. And now we are going to start with uh, the first topic, which is decision making before moving to game theory. So, uh, let me start with, uh, okay, just a second. This is, a, by the way, a very nice example, but let me skip it for now. And to start with a very well-known problem, it's called the three-door problem. Well, how it, how it works. So this is a problem presented to a contestant in the TV game show, Let's Make a Deal. That show was hosted by a very famous guy, Monty Hall, that, were, uh, that they did this show starting from 1967 until 1990. Then the show was over. What was mainly the, the main problem? There was a lot of variation about this game, but I tell you the game. So this is, by the way, Monty Hall. Unfortunately, he died uh, very recently. And uh, so let the game begin. There are three doors on stage. Behind just one door, there is a car. Behind the others, there's nothing. Let's say there are goats. The contestant doesn't know where the car is, and she or he has to pick up a door just to guess a door. Here are the three doors. Behind one of them, let's say behind door number one, the car is, but the, the contestant, the visitor, doesn't know that behind one is the car. But he has to guess. He, should, he can guess one, two, or three. So uh, uh, maybe point out to say one, okay? So he picks, he picks up one door, one. Now I tell you what happened. The host who knows what's behind the doors and the host knows where the car is behind what door, he opens one of the other two doors which hides a goat. So let's say that even if the contestant pointed out on the right door, there are, if it pointed out on the right door, there are other two doors are empty. So he will open up one of the two empty doors. If he pointed out on an empty door, suppose the car is behind two, and he points out on one, then he will open up the other empty door three. So the contestant can now choose. Now he tells, he gives him a, a chance and say, do you want to stick to your choice or do you want to change? Let's say if the host open up door number three, the empty door number three, then one can either stick to his door, to his choice door number one, or he can switch to door number two. Let me read it with you. The contestant can now choose to open the door which he first chose, namely stick to his first choice, or he can switch and open the one door left closed, which is number two here. If there is a car behind the door open, he or she wins. So no matter if he try to, if he decide to stick or to switch, we, we open up the door eventually he chose. If he has the car, it's his. If he doesn't have the car, he gets nothing. Okay, so this is the problem, the three door problems. You have to guess where the car is. And after guessing, the, the host open up some empty door, one of the, at least one empty door, he opens up one empty door. And now you can either switch to the one that's still closed or you can stick. So the question will be switch or stick. Okay, let's continue. 
to stick or to switch. That's the problem. This is the question. What does it matter? From the participant's point of view, from the contestant, each door looks as if has equal likelihood of revealing the card. So I left with two doors empty, I mean, with two closed doors. Why it matters if I switch or I stick? It's 50 50. Looks like. Once the host open an empty door, the car is behind one of the two remaining doors with equal probability, equal likelihood. So who cares to stick or to switch? Looks like. Hence, there is no advantage or disadvantage in changing the initial choice. Is this so? The answer, no, the answer is no. This, is this so? Let's see. Before we get to that, I want to introduce you to Marilyn. Marilyn Valsaba. She not only pretty woman, but she has another qualification. Column, she's a columnist of the Ask Marilyn column in Parade magazine. And in addition, she listed in the, gym, the Guinness Book of World Records for the highest IQ, namely she had the highest IQ in the world, 228. So you cannot suspect that she's not smart enough. Okay. Now, let's see what she said about it. In her weekly column, she claimed that she participant, that the participant would do better switching those. You have to switch those. Why? I claim, she claims, you double the chance of winning. Let's see in a second why. But first of all, it's really non-intuitive because there are two doors. Why if I switch, I do better than I stick? Actually, I do twice as much, twice. The probability is twice as higher uh, if I switch than if I stick. She has received as a result of her uh, article that you should switch, she received about 10,000 letters, the great majority disagreeing with her. About 1,000 letters were written by mathematician and mathematicians and scientists. So we're talking about clever guys. So 1,000 letters were from from uh, either scientists or mathematicians. And uh, let me, during the heat of this debate, the New, the New York Times published a large front page article in July 21st, 1991, Sunday issue. Okay, about this problem, about that game. This was written, here is the letter, just, uh, as a typical letter by a professor of mathematics. So this was written by Robert Zucks, a professor of mathematics at George Mason University. This is in Baltimore. And uh, he says the following. Why I cannot switch it? Yeah, okay. In situations, uh, here is his letter, sorry about that. He writes to Marilyn, and he says, you blew it. Let me explain. If one door is shown to be a loser, that information changes the probability of either remaining choice, neither of which has any reason to be more likely, namely to one half. So again, exactly what the, the intuition says. If there are only two doors, the probability of each one of these two is going to be one half. Okay, 
and therefore you are wrong that one should, that the participant should switch those. And he could continue and add, I'm very concerned with the general public's lack of mathematical skills. Please help by confessing your error and in the future being more careful. So there's a letter, completely wrong letter, by a well-known mathematician. Okay. So what does it mean? It means that sometimes when you, have to, you have to take a decision. You cannot just rely on your intuition. You have to check it carefully. The intuition indeed says, or the intuition is that uh, it's uh, the same probability of each one of the two remaining doors, so why to switch? However, this is wrong, and that mathematician together with another 10,000 uh, mathematicians and scientists were wrong about it. In situations involving uncertainty, we tend to assume that the possible outcomes are equally likely. If we have two possible outcomes, uh, the probability is half and half. No. For instance, I'll give you a, an example. Let's say that every morning I have to cross the street uh, when I go to work. And there are two outcomes whether I will cross the street safely or I will be uh, hit by a car. There are two uh, outcomes, but still it's not half and half. If it would be half and half, I would not be, would be able to talk to you now. I would be lying very quietly in some cemetery. So it's not that you have two outcomes, it must be half and half. I agree, however, that the intuition about the two doors that the law, the two closed doors, uh, the intuition is that in that case, maybe it's half an hour, but it's not. There are two possible strategies. I want to now explain why it is not half an hour. Actually, I say that you double the probability of winning if you switch. Okay, so let me go quietly or slowly uh, about the reasoning. So there are two possible strategies. To stick to the door which has chosen first. I chose a door, I stick, I don't care if you open some empty door to me. I know that there is one empty door at least. So what, what do I gain? gain anything by seeing that door? Two, the other strategy, to switch and open the other door. Now, Clearly, if the contestant chooses the sticky strategies, okay, I, let's say, point out on door number one. And then uh, I don't care. The host will open up an empty door and I stick to my door. So my chance is one out of three. What is the chance of uh, choosing the right door right away? It's, uh, I point out on one door out of three, there is only one car behind one of these doors. My chance is one to three, or if you like, 33.3%. One out of three. Now, let's, so if I choose the strategy to stick, not to change, the chance that I will win the car is one out of three, one third. Now let us check what happens if I choose the other strategy, switch. If he chooses the switchy strategy, he will win the car, I claim, with probability of two thirds. And the question is, why? Here's the explanation. Suppose that he chooses to switch doors. So he decided, my strategy, I'm going to switch a door. If he chooses first an empty door, what happens if the contestant chooses first an empty door? So he chooses an empty door. Here are the, hold on a second, I need help here. 
write on it. Thank you. So here are the three doors. They are closed. Okay. Suppose <clears throat> I pointed out to this one and this is empty. Now, the host will open up if this is empty. I don't know if this is, let's say the car is here. So the host must open up this one, another empty. So what happens if I switch those? If this is empty and this is empty, the last one, door number two, has the car. So if I switch, for sure, if I switch, for sure I win the car. Let's understand it. If I don't say that the door that I pointed out first is an empty door, but if it is empty and I switch, I win the car. Again, if it was empty, then uh, the host will open up another empty. And if I switch, I must switch to the door with the car. So the switching strategy, in case I pointed out in the first place on empty door, guarantee that I'll get the car. But what is the chance that immediately when my first choice is such that I choose an empty door. This probability is two out of three because there are two empty doors out of the three. So what is the chance at the beginning when I choose a door, it's empty, to serve? With that probability, if I switch, I win the car. So the probability of winning the car using the switching strategy is to serve. Quite amazing, isn't it? So switching double the probability of winning. Uh, now let me raise it. I need help here. You see, I'm with some friend that helps me to erase. Um, so suppose that the contestant chooses to switch doors. If he chooses first an empty door, which happens with probability two out of three, he wins for sure. The host opens the empty door and then switches to the door with the car. Then the contestant who switches, door, I mean, op, uh, switches to the door that behind that you have the car and you win the car. So let me, I mean, some of, uh, some of you may not, uh, it looks, may look to you a little bit uh, strange the way we put it, we explain it. So let me try to give you another alternative uh, uh, explanation. But before that, I'll have to take a little bit of my coffee, a schluck of my coffee. Ah, I like it a lot. Good. So <clears throat> let's say that we play the same game, but we change a little bit the rules of the game. What are the rules of the game? Following the initial selection of a door, we start the same way. The contestant can either open it, so you open, you, you point out on a door, and then you have it after you point it out, you have the chance, it's up to you if you want to open it and see if you win or not. Probability one serve. Or otherwise, I allow you as the host, if you don't like the door or you want to switch, I'll open up the other two doors. And if the car is behind one of the other two doors, you get it. Okay, so you have the, the chance of either open your first choice, or open both the remaining doors and win the car if it is, if the car is behind one of the two doors that you open up simultaneously. So here it's clear that, I mean, you should switch to the other two doors because you have now two doors, if, if, if behind one of them you have the car, you win. Now the chance of winning the car is to serve. 
So in this simple game, it's clear that you have to switch. Is it the same as the original game? I claim it is. Why? Because look, say that what happened in the original game if you switch? You first, you first point out on a, uh, on a door. Then the host open up an empty door and you switch. So as if he opens up the two doors. Instead of one after the other, in the new game, you open up both of them together, but it's the same. Again, how it works in the first original game. You pointed out a door, the host opened up a door, and immediately, since you decided to switch, he opens up the other door. So uh, actually, he opens up two doors. That's exactly what happens here. And therefore, the result is, that you have to switch and to guarantee to sell. It is obvious that now the contestant should choose the, to open the two remaining doors. This way, the odds of winning double. By the way, I suggest you, if you want to, to really uh, be comfortable with it, play the game with a friend. Put three cards, okay? let's say two red and one blue. And the idea is to point out, and you put them, uh, 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 you cover the three cards face down, and let's your friend uh, select or guess one of the cards. And the beginning, I mean, make 30 times, experiment 30 times where your friend is, don't, I mean, decide not to switch, namely to stick. And you'll see that around 10 out of the 30 times, your friend wins. And about 20 times, your friend loses. Now you do the same thing another 30 times. And you ask your friend to switch. So he opens up, he points out on a card. You open up one red card. And then if he switches, and then if he, uh, he I mean, the strategy then is to switch us to the other uncovered cup. You will see that with this strategy, he wins about 20 times out of 30. By the way, you don't need to go to 30. After 10, 15 times that you play, you see immediately how, how really the switching strategy gives you about double, double twice as much than uh, with the sticking strategy of winning the, of pointing out eventually to the black card. Okay, so what do we learn here? Actually, this is a single decision maker. It's not, there's no game here that two decision makers. Why? Because the host is bound to do the same thing. He cannot change the rule. You just need to open up the, 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 the an empty door. That's it. The decision, I mean, whoever, I mean, has more than, one strategy is the contestant. You have two strategies, to stick or to switch, and then you have to make up your mind what to do. So this is a single decision maker, and all, it looks very simple problem. And already in this, this simple problem, you can see that it's very, the answer is very non-intuitive. What we conclude, we conclude that even if your intuition tells you, and I am for using your intu intuition first, but then you have to check your intuition in, uh, in the right way, okay? Uh, to be very precise. You may be quite often, maybe surprised, okay. After this example, I want to, uh, so here, um, I, uh, I, whatever I told you now, you can read it. I don't want to spend more. I said enough. And now I'm, uh, I don't know what happened, but uh, here, sorry about that. So I'm coming back. And here's another example. So in a certain population, it's completely different example. In a certain population, one out of 1,000 people carries the HIV virus. You have a very good device to test 
if one has it or not. The testing device is 100% accurate on HIV carriers. Namely, if a person is an HIV carrier and he or she takes the test, they will diagnose positively, the result will be positive 100%. There's no way to make a mistake. So every HIV carrier is positively diagnosed. What about the others? Well, in the others, the, the testing device is not 100%, but almost 100%, 99%. So the testing device is 99% accurate on a non-HIV carriers. Namely, 99 out of 100 non-carriers are diagnosed negatively, one is going to diagnose positively. Okay, I hope it is clear. So I have a testing device which is either 100% or 99% accurate. 100% on HIV carriers, 99% on non-HIV carriers. Again, what does it mean? If you are not, if, if you do not carry the HIV, the chance that it will, you will come positive is one to 100. Okay, now a person chosen at random took a test and tested positively. What is the chance or what is the probability that he is an HIV carrier? That's the question. And uh, um, so um, I asked some doctors, I made this experiment. I asked some doctors, actually very well-known doctors, some of them. And they told me that, um, I actually I asked them a different question. I asked, okay, suppose that somebody is, uh, let's say that he diagnosed positively, would you start with cocktail? You know, the cocktail today to, uh, to deal with the HIV virus. And both of them say yes. Of course, it is so accurate that why should I wait? One of the doctors say I will test again. Correct. But sometimes the reason that you are diagnosed positive, it's not because uh, random, uh, uh, random uh, uh, accident or something like this, but rather it may be because of your skin type or something that relates to you that, uh, uh, that uh, it's, it's you personally, that uh, no matter how many times I will uh, uh, test you, you will always come up with the same outcome, either positive or negative. In any event, um, he said, uh, okay, in any event, if I cannot test it again, uh, or if you test it again positive, for sure, I start a cocktail to give uh, that uh, patient a cocktail. So what do you think? What is the chance? So what, again, what was the experiment? We, we, we chose at random one person on the street and say, excuse me, we have an excellent device, testing device. Would you mind to be tested? And the person said yes, and he was tested positive. What do you think the chance that that person is really uh, carried the HIV virus? And the answer is very little, very surprising. So the answer I can say you tell you now, only nine percent, one out of eleven, nine percent chance that if a person with that testing device is tested positively, the chance that he really carry the virus is only one into 11, okay? 9% only. I want to explain you why it happens through example. One can do it in general, but I'll do it through example. But before I do it, I take my second, this is a second example, a second shluk of my coffee. I like it. Okay, so let's take, let's, in a, uh, 
So here is the uh, here is the reason. Okay, the surprising answer: less than ten percent. Actually, sorry, I say it's nine percent. As I said, one in there. But let let me under, let me explain to you. Let's take hundred thousand people. Okay, of the population, and let's all of them we can put. I mean, and let give all of them tests. But first, before the test, how many carriers we have? We say that in the population, let's come back. In the population, one out of a thousand, for the, the top line, one out of the of thousand people carries the HIV virus. One to a thousand. I go now back to the explanation. So if I have 100,000, one out of every thousand, I'm getting that in this population, 100 people carry the HIV virus. So how many do not carry? How many do not carry? Uh, the rest, 99,900. Okay? Uh, now everyone is taking a test. As you remember, the carriers, I need to... Uh, Okay, so here are the carriers. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, okay, I have some small problem. So I don't know why, but it doesn't work yet. Maybe the color. So I have 100 carriers. Remember, on carriers, it is correct 100%. So all the carriers, the 100%, will diagnose positively. So how many positive I'm going to get from the carriers? 100. Now let's talk, let's look on the 99,900. How many of them will be positive? It is accurate 99%. So it makes a mistake of 1%. So 1% of the tested people will be diagnosed wrongly. There are non-carriers, but still they are going dia to diagnose positive. So what is 1% of 99,900? This is 999. So how many altogether I have positives? It is 99, 999 plus 100. It is a thousand ninety-nine. So here is the thousand ninety-nine total. How many actually carry? Only one hundred. So the chance is hundred over one thousand ninety-nine. It's about one out of eleven. Let's say you have here eleven hundred. So one hundred uh, dividing by eleven hundred is one over eleven, which is about nine. So the probability that a person tested positively, that the probability that he or she is indeed an HIV carrier is therefore only 9%. Therefore, even after a test, if somebody takes a test and tested positively, is a large room for a mistake. Okay. So uh, what's going on here? Why the, where the intuition uh, really betrayed us? And I tell you what, it lies on the fact that you have only one out of a thousand. It's a very small number of people carry the HIV, only one out of a thousand. So the fact that it's very accurate or not very accurate, that uh, this 100, I mean, uh, do not count much. They are very little. The, the problem is here. When you have so many and you make a mistake of even 1%, you get almost 1,000 mistakes. So here you have almost 1,000 mistakes. So 999. So out of the 1,099, the 1 you have 999 mistakes and 100 not mistakes. So what is the proportion? 100 over. 1,099, which is about 9%. Okay, now I want to erase it. 
Yeah. Okay. So now I want to move on to something that I will not take too much of your patient, but this is very something very new. In Israel, where I'm uh, here now, uh, until May 27, 2020, actually I should maybe update it, but um, we made the test for the coronaviruses. So uh, in uh, all the, the total number of tested people until May 27 was 552, 471 individuals. All with symptoms. At that time, only symptomatic people could take the test. Now, after taking the test, 3% of them, actually 16,771 of them came positive. Now, assume that the test is accurate 99% on both carrier and non carriers. Okay? What's, what is the chance? We'll, let, let, let me analyze, first of all, what's going on here. So I have total of N, uh, in that case was 552, 471. But let's say that I have more than that. I don't know, any number, N. So N people with symptoms, okay? Then some of them has the virus, only 3%. Some of them do not have the virus, 97%. By the way, I think that these numbers are quite uh, right numbers, well, or not out of the range that when you take a test and you have some symptoms, 3% actually are, test, are going to be tested positively and all the other negative. It's enough that you feel a little bit headache, which happens quite a bit, quite, a, quite often, and you are afraid that maybe you have the virus, you go and test uh, and uh, figure out that you have nothing. Okay, so out of the N, 3%, okay, our corona has the the coronavirus, and the other 97 percent do not. Now I give tests to all of them. So if I test, if those those uh, corona, uh, hold on, now I can yeah. So all those coronavirus carries, okay? I give them a test. So the test actually is accurate 99%. All of them should be positive, but not all of them will come positive because it's accurate 19.99. So actually, how many of them will be uh, uh, tested positively? I have to multiply 3% times 99%. It is 0 0.0297 times the total number of the population. So if the population is 100,000, multiply this by 100,000. So how many actually are going to be tested negatively? Okay, this is the mistake. It's 0 0.03 times 0 0.01 and So these are the negative. Now I do the same thing with the non-coronavirus. So the mistake will be here to, to be tested positively. So how many, first of all, Remember, it's accurate 99%. So it makes a mistake of 1%. These are all should be negative, but there is a mistake of 1%. So 0 0.01, you have to multiply out of the 0 0.97, okay, of the non-coronavirus carriers. So this time this, you get this number. And that is the proportion of the population, of the population with symptoms, that will end up positive from the non-carriers. So I get that this, the number of positive here and the number of positive here. So now I have to, so what is the probability, okay? A person with a, with a, with a symptom tested positively. What is the probability that he indeed is a carrier, okay? Remember, the, the device is accurate 99% on both sides. If you carry it, it will tell you that you are plus with a probability 0.99. And if you don't carry the virus, it will tell you you are going to be tested negatively with probability 0.99. So now I want to see, I, I take a person with 
uh, symptom, and I test him. And he comes uh, positive. Then what is the chance that indeed he carried the virus? So I should look, uh, first of all, who, I mean, to carry, indeed, who carries the virus? Only part of these people. So these are the positive that comes from the right ones. This is it. And this is the total positive. It's this plus this. So I get all this. The N you can cancel out, and you get 297 over 297 plus 97. You multiply everything by 10,000, you get this, and here you get this, and here you get this. And the answer is 0.754. What do we conclude? About 75.4% of people with symptoms who tested positively are infected. So there is a mistake of about 25% mistake, false alarm. And that, by the way, at least uh, at the time in Israel, I don't know now, but if they prove it or not, but uh, they, what they do, if you, if you uh, let's say, you carry the virus after you, uh, you become healthy again, they check you twice. And only if you, if you test it twice negatively, they let you go out. Why? Because they are afraid that there is a mistake. And as you can see, a mistake, I mean, this is not far away from reality, my, the, that example. And as you can see, you get, uh, I mean, the mistake can be the magnitude of 25%. So one has to be careful at least to understand what's going on, what takes a decision. Uh, about uh, should I lock you up in some uh, on isolation because you may carry or not? Should I let you go out when you are healthy? Are you really healthy? Or you still have the virus? All this should take into account the probability of being correct or 0.25, the probability of a mistake. I think that so. Again, we're talking about like a single decision maker. I mean, it's not that somebody goes against you and there is a conflict between somebody. No, each one, each individual is by herself. They take the test and whether they tested positive or negative. And we are talking about really single decision maker. Simple looks like situations. Still, a lot of non intuitive outcomes, and therefore, one has to be very, very careful. Now, uh, uh, so we finished what I want to give you an, some examples about single decision maker. And now uh, we are going to switch to actually strategic interruption. I do something that affects you, or you do something that affects me, and uh, so gains you. So we'll see you soon in our next interaction. Thank you.